Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Talking Stuff, the Ohio State Recruiting Podcast brought to you by your good friends at Letterman Row and helped today, of course, by our good friends at Byers Auto. Uh, I'm Jeremy Birmingham. On the other line with me is Spencer Holbrook, as always. Once again, folks, I apologize. We don't have video this week, uh, but uh, I'm not in a position where I want to uh, be on video because uh, we're not not really uh, in, in the video place. You know, we're, this is a podcast after all. Right, Spencer? Yeah. More, I think more people listen to it and walk away from their screen, even when we have video. I hope so. I don't want people looking at me that much anyway. It's not really. Yeah, they're just staring. Right. It's not like they're getting anything out of looking at me because it's not like I'm that great to look at anyway. So anyway. We have great podcasting faces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Definitely have a face for podcasts. That's what I was always told that I was younger. I had a face for radio. And now it's it's great to see it come to fruition as I've gotten older. Um (laughs) So Spencer, uh, this last week on campus in Columbus, we the last time we talked uh, for talking stuff, um, we broke down a lot of the 2020 class, the the guys that had signed, the early enrollees that we got a chance to hang out with on Wednesday. Um, and we we talked a little bit about Kerry Combs on, on Wednesday's edition of Talking Stuff, but not a lot about Corey Dennis. And and I think that it's an interesting topic just because it seems to be one that is everyone so divided. Um, you know, obviously he's a young guy, 28 years old. He's been at Ohio State for five years as an assistant, as a GA. Um, and now he's the quarterbacks coach for Ryan Day and arguably a position room that is as productive and as attractive to recruits as any in the country um, based on the results from Dwayne Haskins and, Jay, and Justin Fields in the last two years. If you would take off your uh, quasi recruiting analyst cap here and just give me what it is that you think as a objective sports analyst and rec- and writer and you know journalist, do you think that Corey Dennis should have been given that job? Uh, I do think he should have been given the job, but I do think Ohio State should have done their uh, its due diligence and went out and in- and included a couple more people into this conversation because I think. I think there could have been a meeting between Ryan Day and a couple other people in this profession with a little bit more experience that he could have found out aligned with what he wants to do. And but but when it comes down to it, Corey Dennis, you know, like Ryan Day said, he picked him up from the airport three years ago. He knows him like they, he's kind of been Ryan's right hand man in that quarterback room. And to be able to promote him for the hard work and the what he's shown Ryan Day, like he said, and, and people will get to hear it um, this upcoming week. He had a three-year uh, audition for Ryan Day. His, his job interview wasn't an hour and a half. It wasn't a three-hour meeting over the phone. He had a three-year audition to tell Ryan Day, hey, I can do this job as well as anyone in the country. And Ryan Day took to that, and, and he understands that. And I, So I think there are two sides to the same coin. There should have been – I think there could have been a little more due, due, due diligence done to find out and make sure that he was the right guy. But also that three-year audition was pretty big for for Corey Dennis. Yeah, obviously people, the the question marks are about whether or not Corey Dennis was given the job because of who his father-in-law is. And for those of you who are listening and have been living under a rock in the Ohio State world, uh, Corey Dennis' father-in-law is Urban Meyer, who, um, if you weren't aware, used to be a a head football coach. um, And now he's a TV guy, right? Um, Yeah. Here's the thing. Corey Dennis had accepted a job with Colorado State and was basically already beginning the moving process of of heading to Colorado State to work with Steve Adazio. And in my mind, and this is going to sound crazy, because obviously Ohio State, the job itself is a much bigger job and one that uh, will be, you know, under a magnifying glass. But when it comes to the idea of like nepotism or whatever, I think it was more obvious in the fact that he had been get, given the Colorado State job because Steve Adazio and Urban are so close. Um, and I, I think it was more obvious there because I, the reports and rumors were that Urban had been sort of involved in the coaching uh, pursuit uh, for Colorado State, helping them put candidates together. And I'm not sure why. I know, obviously, Earl Bruce uh, coached there and Urban may have some connections uh, there because of that, but... The fact that Adazio, after being uh, 
unceremoniously dismissed by Boston College, gets that job over two other Ohio State assistants, which is, you know, another story. But um, and then and then Corey Dennis is given that job at Colorado, Colorado State without really much thought at all, it seemed like. I would I would imagine Ryan Day put a lot more thought into hiring him to be the quarterbacks coach at Ohio State than than it was than Steve Adazio was giving him to take that job in, in Fort Collins. Am I am I reading that wrong, or am I just trying to see things? No, in, because I think you're exactly right. Because Adazio doesn't know as much about Corey Dennis as Ryan Day does. He just knows that he's Urban Meyer's son-in-law and he's worked with a couple Heisman Trophy candidates. Uh, as an analyst, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't know his work ethic. He doesn't know what he puts into it. Ryan Day does. So Ryan Day, you know, could do his homework a lot better than Steve Adazio could. And that Corey Dennis hire at, at uh, Colorado State was was happening pretty, pretty quickly. And uh, I just think, yeah, like you said, there's a little more nepotism going on there than there was in Columbus. And uh, I don't think we're reading that incorrectly at all. I think I think he has proved himself at Ohio State enough to where he earned this job. Yeah, and, and it's something that Corey and I talked about last week, and it'll be on the episode of Bermanology that you mentioned and referenced uh, earlier. But uh, this is not a guy who was – Ryan Day is not in a position where he owes anybody anything. And, and I think that that's something people are reading too much into. Like, he's, he doesn't owe Urban Meyer a, a favor at this point, like, yeah, Urban Meyer hired Ryan Day. That's great. But this is Ryan Day's program at Ohio State. And I don't think that he's in a position where he's willing at all to risk his program's future success by hiring a coach that he didn't 100% believe in. And I, I think it's crazy kind of that with everything that uh, Day has accomplished already and as competent as he's been in every single aspect of his job, it seems weird to me that people would make a leap uh, and assume that in this one area, all of a sudden he's a complete, you know, uh, pushover and just willing to take whatever Urban Meyer told him to do. That just seems weird to me. It's fair to be skeptical of the hire. I understand that if you're a skeptic sure. of the hire, sure, it's Ohio I State. It, it's Ohio State. You think that a guy who's going to be coaching the most ho- high-profile room in the country may have some experience at the position. I mean, I, that's understandable. I get it from that point of view for sure. And I think. I think this might happen a couple other times as we go down the road in Ryan Day's tenure because they're grooming more coaches to be promoted rather than and who understand the culture rather than going out and getting guys who you would say are quote unquote big names. I think this is going to, to happen more often than you would expect at Ohio State. Well, yeah, that, I, that's just a hunch I have. But they're grooming coaches to be, you know, good position coaches. You look at some of the quality control and analysts they have in the building right now. And those guys are going to be position coaches, and they might be position coaches for the first time at Ohio State. It's not going to surprise me. Right, and people, I think, should understand that you know, unless you were a diehard football guy, you didn't know who Jeff Halfley was a year ago, and that turned out okay. And obviously, we know who Corey Dennis is because he's been in Columbus for five years. But you know, he's a guy that worked intimately with Zach Smith and helping him recruit. He's a guy that worked with Brian Hartline and Ryan Day and helping them recruit. So you know that that Corey Dennis as a 28 year old is going to be able to relate to kids. He's a guy who played college football. He's a guy that uh, is very personable. Once you get a chance to sit and talk to him in a, in a one-on-one setting. Um, And I think that that's resonating with recruits. I know that for Jack Miller, for CJ Stroud, for Kyle McCord, all those guys have talked about the relationship that they have with Corey Dennis. And it wasn't really ever about the relationship they had with Mike Yersich. So I think that there's something to just look at as a potential harbinger for the future of like, okay, how, how can this, how does this pan out? Um, but I think we've already seen it a little bit because Dennis was much more involved in the on campus recruiting and the just relationship building with these kids that are already at Ohio State than Yersich was. And I, I, I don't know if that was just a byproduct of, of Mike's being, um, you know, thinking about already leaving Ohio State or how that worked out. But anyway, that's 10 minutes on Corey Dennis. Let's move on because I think we're comfortable um, with it. And uh, again, you should check out the episode of Bermanology on Letterman Row uh, with Corey Dennis. He, he is a guest uh, this coming week. So um, I, I do want to talk a little bit about, you know, we're talking about coaches and, and the randomness and, and sudden coaching changes and that kind of stuff. Um Sunday morning in the in the uh, dotting the eyes column on on the website, 
we I wrote about Marcus Bradley, a uh, four-star defensive tackle from Quince Orchard uh, in Gaithersburg, Maryland, who did not include Penn State on his top 10 list, and he, it's, which was crazy because he's been to Penn State like multiple times. He's been to Ohio State twice last November. He's a kid that there's two 247 crystal balls uh, predictions right now for Bradley. They're both in Ohio State's favor, so maybe it wouldn't matter. But apparently Penn State didn't tell him that Sean Spencer was leaving. Um, Ouch. And I, I th- he found out um, in conversation, I think, with me, to be honest, uh, because I asked him about it, and he was like, what? That's happening? Um and and then Penn State was not in his top ten, and I think that that's obviously a, a direct correlation. Yeah, I think that 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 makes a lot of sense if you're the, if you're the one that spilled the beans on that one, Vern. I mean, it was it was after it was public. It wasn't like a, a, a you know inside baseball talk or anything. I just said, hey, no. I said, hey, how does this re- how does him leaving impact your uh, relationship with Penn State? How does what does it do for that program? And then he was like, oh, he's leaving. When did that happen? I'm like, okay, a little awkward, but um, it it happens. And I guess the reality is, when you're still trying to finish out a 2020 class and your premier assistant coach decides to up and leave for the NFL. Um, I, there may be other guys that are more important to talk to about it other than, other than a, a junior in high school. So I, I'm not saying Penn State's wrong for it, but I think it's just funny to watch. And we talk about relationships and how important they are on the recruiting stuff. But like that requires constant communication with these kids. And if you're really high priority for a, a program like Penn State or Ohio State or anywhere else, it seems to me that it's easy to tell where you really stack up in their minds based on what they don't tell you. Yeah. And what you're saying makes a lot of sense. There's not really much else to add to it, but that's, I don't know. That's the nature of recruiting. I guess if you're, if you're being left out of the loop of something, you can kind of read the tea leaves there. And we try and read tea leaves all the time. And I guess uh, kids can do the same. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's really what this business is about is about learning how to read between the lines and, um, a lot of the kids right now are so savvy that they pick up on that stuff. And I, I would be shocked if Penn State is not still in the mix for him. I, maybe it's just one of his ways of, um, you know, giving them the proverbial bird for, for a moment, I guess. Um, and just saying, hey, that's kind of messed up. But I bet Penn State still gets in the mix. I think Ohio State is still in a really great position with Bradley. I think it's going to be interesting to see what they do with the defensive tackle position because of Tumiche Adelele um, and, and uh, JT, to, uh, my, my, I don't know how to say his last name, out in Seattle. Uh, and then, uh, you know, you have the, the guys like um, – like Bradley, uh, Bradley's teammate at Quince Orchard is Damian Robinson, who's a Ohio State top target as far as the edge rusher goes. And so you wonder if there's a, a maybe a, a chance that they go that route or, or pass up somebody else like a Adelele, um because of the fact that they, they maybe can get a two for one at Quince Orchard if they if they play it right. So it's fascinating to think about the um the way recruiting works because every everything you do impacts something else. Yeah. And the, the board for Ohio state is pretty simple right now, right? Because they have these two guys, like you said, you could potentially have a two for one situation if you play your cards, right. Um, and then this defensive line recruiting is about to, I think it's about to pick up in a big fashion. I think we're going to see some, some, uh, some pins get knocked down pretty quickly. Yeah, and then you still have Taiwan Malone over in New Jersey, who is undoubtedly a, a priority for Ohio State, and um, they're going to be really selective, I think, with with that defensive tackle spot. But they're going to want three or four guys at that position because of everything that's leaving the program in the next two years. So um, they're going to they're going to go ahead. We didn't even touch on you know guys like Damon Payne and and other defensive ends that that could still be in the fold here. You know, there there are some other guys. That are that are really talented guys that that you know we just we didn't even mention right there and and, and that tells you a lot about the state of the recruiting the defensive tackle position in Ohio State in right now it's it's looking pretty good I think there's a lot of reason to be optimistic yeah it, Larry Johnson has always been a little bit more methodical in the way he recruits kids he doesn't go out and just um, shotgun offer and, and offer 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 blah, 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 blah. you know like he, he takes his time he builds relationships before he offers and then he still doesn't really recruit kids until they've been on campus and until he's had a chance to meet them and their families and has a chance to see the way they move 
So when you think about a guy like uh, JT out in, in at Sammamish High School, uh, G Scott's teammate, um, who's obviously the you know a top five player in the country, you see that kid and you think, oh, why isn't Ohio State going crazy for this kid yet? But that's because he hasn't been on campus. And G Scott told me last week he thought that once JT gets on campus, he'll quote fall in love with it like like he did. But it's fascinating just to see how this plays out in the next month or so because um, Ohio State is is going to have so many kids come in and it's really a pairing down process where they get an opportunity to see like, okay, this kid, we like this kid, eh, this kid, we do this kid. We like more than we thought we would. This kid's family's kind of weird. So there's always these um, little check boxes that are going to be checked off in the next month. And I'm really excited to uh, see it, but I'm also excited to be getting out of town for a week. Um, I'm heading to uh, another foreign soil. I'm heading to foreign soil. Spencer, and I'm a little nervous. I've never traveled internationally before. Um, and you hate flying. And so. I hate flying. Yeah. So uh, Spencer is going to be handling the stuff this week. Uh, there will not be another episode of Talking Stuff until I get back next uh, weekend. But uh, the dotting the I's stuff, um, Spencer will handle a couple times this week with my help uh, from abroad. I, I just like, I think it's great how many different terms there are for travel. You know? Hey. Go ahead. Where, yeah. Do you do you think uh, people are gonna like try and figure out where you are? I mean, probably. I, I think it's I think it's like a secretive location right now. Where in the world out. is Letterman Row? Oh. I don't know if there's gonna be any road beers there. So uh, maybe that's uh, yeah, I'm actually kind of concerned about that, and I know Austin is too, but um, there there may be a shortage of good beers uh, where we're heading, and uh, I don't know. I'm not into the Bud Light Lime stuff, you know what I mean? So yeah. we got to figure out a way to address but, um, that potential problem. But I'll be handling DTU, like you said. We can get this thing back on track. Yeah, so Spencer's doing that. Um, like I said, I will be helping him. It's not like we're going to be in a, re- in a location so remote that there is no um, internet access or anything like that. But it, Another hint. It will be it will be um, a different week for readers and stuff like that on the site. So uh, thanks for giving me a little time off here, Spencer. And for those of you watching, listening, uh, seeing our motionless faces on this picture on YouTube, um, thanks for taking the time to watch it on here, even though you don't get to see them moving pictures. Uh, So uh, this has been Talking Stuff uh, brought to you by our friends at Buyers Auto. For Letterman Row, I'm Jeremy Birmingham. That has been Spencer Holbrook, and we will talk to you folks next week. Thanks for watching. Subscribe below to get the latest videos from Letterman Row. We've got Letterman Live. We've got the practice report. we got rapid reaction. Hey, and you know we got Buck IQ with Zach Bourne. For sure. we got recruiting breakdowns with Berm. we got whatever you need. Ohio State football and Ohio State athletics, we've got you covered here at Letterman Row.